individuals the rigors necessary to both maintain and establish independence in the judiciary, it often comes down to sometimes the acts of individual judges, and sometimes it's about individual courage. Uh, when we think about uh, our own court system here in the United States, we are often inspired by the view of the Supreme Court and even more uh, in place with the attitude of judges, of their opinions, and of the history making that they have done uh, in terms of both their opinions and their standing on various issues. When we look around the world uh, to other countries around the world that are also struggling with this question of digital independence, Pakistan has to be one of them. Uh, over the last several decades, and it's in Pakistan's now 70 year of existence, we have seen the struggle between executive authority, parliamentary ascendancy, and the judiciary. And as, as Judge Bennett pointed out repeatedly in his uh, colloquies about the judiciary, our own experience has told us that this is a time-honored tradition and that no struggle is going to simply be achieved overnight. Well, in this example, when we think of Pakistan, and particularly with Pakistan's struggle to establish democracy, to maintain the rule of law, and most importantly, to maintain uh, a balance among various powers with so many pressures, both internal and external, at the forefront, it seems to me only appropriate that we end this, this symposium with such a speaker. Justice Jelani is the former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Pakistan, but like so many, he started his career as an attorney in the district courts, in this particular case in the District of Multan, and subsequently became advocate for the High Court. Later, he became a judge in the Lahore High Court and also an advocate general of Punjab in 1993. His elevation to the Supreme Court in December, 23, uh, December 2013 um, also, however, took um, after a postscript of a maelstrom where uh, a, a military coup in Pakistan led us to a situation where he was being forced, like so many other judges, to swear an oath to, an, to what was regarded as an unconstitutional order, an ascendant uh, military, and rather than take on the potential for power, he refused to do so with so many other judges and, and justices of the court. So in that, in that same regard, and despite the fact that he has now stepped away from the direct political fray of Pakistan and taken on roles at the World Justice Forum, he has still led a productive life in terms of his role in upholding the rule of law and maintaining its integrity. And with that, I'd like to introduce Chief Justice Jelani to take the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hamad, for your very kind introduction. And thank you, Jess Track, for inviting me today as a keynote speaker, which I take as a great honor. And uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your presence and for your attention span. I've been asked to speak on judicial independence, the role of the Supreme Court in Pakistan and my tenure as Chief Justice of Pakistan. I'll just uh, briefly comment on what judicial independence is, what are its various constituent elements, how the Constitution of Pakistan has provided textual guarantees to ensure that. What is the role of the Supreme Court under the Constitution? And what role the bar, the media, and civil society has played in maintaining judicial independence and then I'll briefly 
comment on my tenure as the Chief Justice. As you are all aware, ladies and gentlemen, judicial independence is one of the fundamental values which underpin the foundation of a justice system in a democracy. While commenting on the importance of judicial independence, Alexander Hamilton, one of the framers of the American Constitution, once remarked, and I quote, there is no liberty if the power of judging be not separated from legislative and executive powers, liberty can have nothing to fear from judiciary alone, but have everything to fear from its union with either of the other departments." Unquote. The Constitution of Pakistan contains specific provisions regarding judicial independence. The very preamble of the Constitution mandates inter alia, and I quote, independence of judiciary shall be fully secured. There are two aspects of judicial independence. One is individual and the other is institutional. To ensure individual independence, the selection and appointment of judges in Pakistan is done by a judicial commission which is headed by the Chief Justice of Pakistan and comprises the four senior most judges of the Supreme Court, a senior advocate of the Supreme Court nominated by the Bar Council and Attorney General for Pakistan. The nomine nominees of the commission, I mean the judges who are recommended, are sent to a bipartisan parliamentary committee. Now that committee is bipartisan because it comprises of eight members, four from the opposition and four from the treasury benches. When the recommendations for appointment of judges is received from the Judicial Commission by this parliamentary committee, the committee can either confirm nomination by a simple majority or it can reject with three-fourths majority, but within a period of 14 days of having received the nomination, failing which the nominations are deemed to be confirmed. And thereafter, those are sent to the president for a point, uh, necessity order. To ensure security of tenure, the judges of the Supreme Court and High Court retire on attaining the age of superannuation and they can only be removed by a Supreme Judicial Council on charges of misconduct. That council is headed by the Chief Justice and comprises of two senior most judges of the Supreme Court and two senior most Chief Justices of the High Court. We have four high courts, because we have four, uh, uh, five uh, high courts, we have uh, uh, five uh, provinces. The judges are bound by code of conduct issued by the Supreme Judicial Council and also the mandate of their respective oaths of office. Before he or she assumes the office of a judge, a declaration is made on solemn affirmation that, and I quote, in all circumstances, I'll do a right to all manner of people according to law without fear or favor, affection or uh, ill will, unquote. It is only through a strict adherence to this oath that judges would inspire people's confidence and trust in their neutrality and integrity. Such a trust is not something static, and this is very important. Th such a trust is not something static. Rather, it is fluid. It was the loss of this public trust which prompted Justice John Stephen of U.S. Supreme Court 
to remark in that famous Gore versus Bush's case, and I quote, uh, he was the di di one of the dissenting judges. He said, although we never know with complete certainty the identity of the winner of this year's pre presidential election, the identity of the loser is perfectly clear. It is the nation's confidence in the judge as an impartial guardian of the rule of law, unquote. Then uh, the other aspect, institutional independence. The institutional independence in Pakistan has been safeguarded by certain specific constitutional provisions. The ju judiciary stands separated from the executive by a constitutional mandate. There is a clog on the parliamentary power that it can legislate on any item in the federal legislative list except the Supreme Court. That is, the powers of the Supreme Court can be enlarged, but those powers cannot be curtailed. This is a constitutional provision. To insulate the judiciary from any discussion or controversy in the parliament, it has been specifically provided that no discussion shall take place in the parliament with respect to the conduct of a judge of the Supreme Court or a High Court in the discharge of his duties. The judiciary has also been given a financial autonomy by, by providing or that all expenditure on judiciary would be charged upon the federal consolidated fund and provincial consolidated fund in terms of the specific articles of the Constitution and such expenditure shall be immune from discussion or vote in the Parliament. Then there is a specific article in the Constitution to the effect that the decisions of the Supreme Court shall be binding on all other institutions in the country. Now this brings me to the role that the Supreme Court plays in the political system of our country. We must keep in mind that judicial independence is not an end in itself. In the constitutional scheme that underpins the trichotomy of powers among the three organs of the state and provides an elaborate regime of fundamental rights, the judiciary performs two functions primarily. That is, keeping each organ of the state within the limits of his powers defined under the constitution and secondly, ensuring the enforcement of fundamental rights of the people. The judiciary performs these functions through its power of judicial review. Fundamental rights and judicial review are the central pillars of the Constitution. These two pillars play a critical role in the creation, sustenance and development of a people centric constitutionalism, democracy, and the rule of law regime. This is because the constitutional regime of fundamental rights is an irrevocable constitutional contract between the state and the people of Pakistan. Unlike many other political systems in the world where such rights are provided through acts of the parliament, the constitution of Pakistan dedicates a full chapter on fundamental rights. There are about more than 20 fundamental rights. I need not uh, uh, dilate in detail on that, but briefly, uh, judicial, uh, it, religious freedom, uh, equality before law, uh, right to fair trial, all these are fundamental rights. The rationale behind embedding these rights in the Constitution was 
that these may not be tampered with by passions of the day are fluctuating majorities in the parliament. This is reflective of one of the most fundamental features of our constitution, that is substantive democracy. Democracy underpins a complex interplay between majority and minority rights. The enforcement of such rights promotes tolerance, pluralism, and a liberal society. It is only in such a society that democracy can be preserved. The powers of judicial review guarantee the enforcement of the irrevocable constitutional contract between the people as the principal and the state as the agent. Therefore, it would not be an exaggeration to suggest that in the absence of fundamental rights and their enforcement through judicial review, there would be such a constitutional void that it would be difficult to sustain the public legitimacy of our constitutional structure. It is therefore important to understand the concept of judicial review, its parameters, and how this power over the years has expanded the role of the Supreme Court. I'll discuss this uh, in f four different aspects. Firstly, the constitutional and historical context of the development of fundamental rights and judicial review in Pakistan. Secondly, the comparative and global context of the expansion, expansion of constitutionalism and judicial review. And thirdly, the enforcement of fundamental rights through public interest litigation. And fourthly, the radical shift of the enforcement of fundamental rights through judicial review in the post-2007 period when martial law was imposed by General Musharraf. <coughs> Unlike some other countries, Pakistan has been lucky to have a history at least of a formal constitutional fundamental rights regime and judicial review in all the three of its constitutions, that is the 1956, the 1963 constitution, and the 1973. The problem has, of course, been in the lack of constitutional stability and the constitutional structure as the 1956 constitution was abrogated by martial law regime in 1958, and the weak constitutional structure of 1962 was abrogated by martial law in 1969. But despite the imposition of military rule three times, that is 1977, 1999, and on the 3rd of November 2007, the Constitution of 1973 has never been abrogated, and the fundamental rights and constitutional regime, the constitution judici uh, constitutional judicial review regime, has not gone through any uh, radical alteration and remain intact. Since 1973, Pakistan had a stable constitutional structure providing the necessary conditions for the expansion of fundamental rights and judicial review regimes. Moreover, the judicial innovation shown by the Superior Court judges is obvious from the development of fundamental rights and judicial review jurisprudence since 1956. For instance, it was the Supreme Court which declared 
right to education as a fundamental right. Again, it was the Supreme Court which declared that uh, anything hazardous to environment would constitute violation of fundamental right to life. Then again, it was the Supreme Court which declared that bonded labor was violative of the fundamental right to human dignity. In order to protect judicial independence, the fundamental rights and the judicial review regime, the judicial courage shown by individual judges has been seminal. They refused to take unconstitutional oath imposed by martial law regime in 1981, in 2000, and in 2007. Now, in all these three uh, martial laws, uh, the number of judges uh, who refused to take oath had been progressively rising. And uh, in 2007, about 100 judges refused to take oath. Now, this was the events of 1970, uh, 2007 were unprecedented, and those events were transformative. I say transformative because the entire bar, the civil society, and the public in general came on the street in support of judiciary and against martial law, with the result that the general had to lift the state of emergency, restore democracy, and hold elections. After elections in February 2008, the Constitution was restored. Elected government came into power. General Musharraf resigned. And then the judges were ultimately restored. After the restoration of judges, the Supreme Court uh, through a full court judgment, declared the uh, martial law imposed by General Musharraf to be illegal. It declared that the Supreme Court uh, judgment, which legalized the martial law imposed by uh, uh, General Musharraf, uh, was wrong and it set aside that judgment and the judges who took fresh oath of loyalty to General Musharraf, they were proceeded against on charges of misconduct. Most of them resigned. The expansion of constitutionalism and fundamental rights through judicial review is a global phenomenon, and Pakistan did not remain unaffected. Such developments have been an analyzed by various jurists and scholars like Gresham Helmake, Julio Reyes Figora, by David Ribotson, um, and by Opendra Baxi and Ridwanul Haq from Bangladesh. Tom Ginsberg dis described this global phenomenon in the following terms, and I quote, from France to South Africa to Israel, parliamentary sovereignty has faded away. We are in the midst of a global expansion of judicial review and the most visible and important power of judges is the power of judicial review, unquote. Now, in Pakistan, the Supreme Court has, through the exercise of its power of judicial review, has come out with a, another concept and that is the public interest litigation. Public interest 
Litigation is a kind of litigation which seeks to advance the cause of individuals or disadvantaged groups or which raise issues of public concern. It is a mode to use law to affect social change. The connection between fundamental rights and public interest litigation is aptly captured by an academic who says, and I quote, the guarantees of fundamental rights and assurance of directive principles, directive principles are part of the Constitution, described as the conscience of the Constitution, would have remained empty promises for the majority of illiterate and indigent citizens under adverse earlier proceedings. Public interest litigation has been a conscious attempt to transform the promise into reality, unquote. So the fundamental rights guaranteed by the Constitution is a kind of promise to the citizens. The directive principles provided in the Constitution, again, are a promise to, th to the citizens that the state would do this. Now, public interest litigation has attempted to transform that promise into reality through its power of judicial review. Public interest litigation is a term which finds no place in the Constitution or <coughs> in any other Pakistani law. Therefore, as a constitutional remedy, it <coughs> owes its creation to judicial interpretation interpretation of the constitutional provisions, two constitutional provisions, which are Articles 199, which relate to the powers of the High Courts of uh, Judicial Review, and Article 184.3, which <coughs> relate to the power of the Supreme Court. Then I have referred to various uh, judgments of the Supreme Court in which public interest, interest litigation has been commented upon and under that uh, uh, concept the reliefs were provided and law was uh, late. Ever since the enforcement of fundamental rights through public interest litigation, such litigation has developed immensely with the connected development of the expansion of judicial review. Public interest litigation has taken different procedures or forms, namely through motto cases in which the Supreme Court itself ta uh, takes a notice of a matter without any formal petition on a newspaper report or on a television report, which prima facie indicates violation of a fundamental right the Supreme Court takes up the case. Then uh, we have human right cases. Then we have letters sent to the Supreme Court which have been converted into constitutional petitions. Then we have uh, constitutional petitions filed by individuals and social uh, uh, organizations on issues of public importance. The Supreme Court in 1992, established a human rights cell within the Supreme Court. The human rights cell is an institutional mechanism at the Supreme Court which can be approached by any person or group for redressal of their uh, grievances which relate to violation of their rights. And Mostly, when uh, such a petition is re received, uh, th th they are sent without lawyers. The Director General of Human Rights, he sends a notice to the concerned department, and after receiving the notice, 80% of the uh, grievance is addressed because the concerned department I mean, is made aware that the matter is now in the notice of the Supreme Court. 
So if there is uh, illegality, he would rectify it. If the matter is not settled at the human right cell level, then it is sent to the court to be decided on judicial side, provided it discloses uh, a prima facie violation of fundamental right. Now, after uh, the imposition of martial law in 2007 and the courageous stand taken by the judges when they were restored, uh, there was a tremendous inflow of uh, human rights petitions before the Supreme Court. And the number of cases increased because the public started trusting the court uh, uh, greater. And the Supreme Court also and the High Court also became more active in enforcing those rights because of the uh, uh, independence, because of the confidence gained uh, through that experience of uh, 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 movement for restoration of the uh, judiciary in Pakistan. Now I come to my tenure as Chief Justice of Pakistan. I was a judge of the Supreme Court for a decade, but remained Chief Justice for a short period because of the attainment of age of superannuation. As I assumed the office of the Chief Justice, I had three concerns which influenced my jurisprudence and policy making during the period I held the office. One concern was that Pakistan, in Pakistan, Islam is a state religion. However, there are followers of other religions as well, like Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Bhais. There are fundamental ra fundamentalists and extremists among followers of every faith, and Muslims are no exception. There are some in our country who interpret religious tenets in a rather myopic manner. <coughs> this, at times, leads to religious intolerance. In the wake of such religious extremism, the minorities feel insecure, marginalized, and at times denied their fundamental rights. Democracy is not merely a majority rule. Democracy is also the rule of the basic values, values upon which the whole democratic structure is built and which even the majority cannot touch. It is the Supreme Court which has to actualize the constitutional values and these rights. Although there is a specific provision guaranteeing the right to religious freedom, that is Article 20, but I found that there was no judgment of the Supreme Court to lay down its import and its parameters. In the wake of frequent violations of this right, there was need for a judicial pronouncement not only to provide a sense of security to minorities, but also to sensitize the public about the constitutional rights of the minority communities. This was my first concern. The second was that certain populist judgments of the Supreme Court had interfered with the policy-making domain of the executive authority undermining the principle of separation of powers which underpins the constitutional scheme. This led to unattended adverse effects on national economy. The potential investors considered court interference as a risk factor to invest Pakistan. Some of the cases which sent discouraging signals to potential investors were the privatization of steel mills case, the rental power case, 
and the Zecrodex case. This was my second concern. My third concern as the Chief Justice was that I found that a sufficient amount of time of the court used to be consumed on account of frivolous litigation and frequent exercise of sumoto jurisdiction. This was at the cost of substantive cases which, has which were left out and the backlog was increasing. There was need for court reiteration that such a jurisdiction was meant only for those matters of public interest which were relatable to the enforcement of fundamental rights, particularly of the marginalized community which remained ad unattended as the victims did not have the means to seek redress. Now, how did I address these concerns? While addressing the first concern, I found that Article 20 of the Constitution guaranteed religious freedom, but those interested with the law in enforcement were either not fully aware or sensitized and at times were vulnerable to faith-related prejudices. As a consequence, there were incidents of religious or sectarian violence and discrimination with the result that minorities felt insecure. Religious extremism is one of the elements in our socio-political culture. Religious orthodoxy is a potential threat to judicial independence and judges are vulnerable to threat and assault when they are seized of cases which have religious or sectarian tone. In such a political milieu, the courts have a duty to play a more proactive role in disseminating the constitutional values and enforcing the rule of law. One of the first thing I did was to declare 2014 as the year of religious tolerance and interfaith harmony. Secondly, I took so motto notice of certain incidents of harassment and violence against minorities, particularly the Peshawar Church blast, blast case in which 81 Christians died and several got injured. Although a criminal case was registered in the church, or in the church blast case, but many per months passed and neither the culprits were arrested nor did the aggrieved families receive any financial compensation as promised by the concerned authorities. Besides that, I also took notice of the news items that the members of the Kalash and Ismaili communities were being threatened to change their sect or, or face physical threats. There were other complaints from members of the Hindu and Christian communities as well. I summoned the Attorney General for Pakistan, an Advocate General of four provinces, leaders of minority community. After hearing all these leaders, the law officers and the Attorney General for Pakistan, the court passed a detailed judgment and I authored the judgment. Speaking for the court, I spelled out the meaning and import of Article 20 of the Constitution rel relatable to religious freedom and issued eight directions, both to federal government and four provincial governments to ensure that minority communities enjoyed their right of freedom of religion and belief, that their fundamental right to life is fully secured, that curricula at school and college is appropriately developed to promote a culture of social and religious tolerance, that steps are taken to ensure that hate speeches are discouraged and people involved are punished, that a National Council for Minority Rights be formed and that a special police be created to protect the places of worship of minorities. And that my last direction was that the implementation of this judgment in letter and spirit 
would be ensured by the Supreme Court itself. I created a permanent three-member bench of the Supreme Court to ensure its implementation and that bench is still functioning. While interpreting Article 20 of the Constitution, the court held that religious freedom is available to all, whether Muslims or non-Muslims. The judgment was called a judicial bombshell by a juror. And while commenting on this judgment, he said, and I quote, In other words, Muslims don't have a superior privilege, right to belief, than non-Muslims, but there is an equal religious protection clause under Article 20 for all Pakistani citizens. This is indeed a principal radical implication. Moreover, Article 20 confers further rights. Secondly, the right to profess and practice is conferred not only on religious communities but also on every citizen. In other words, every citizen can exercise such a right to belief <coughs> against the dominant religious views of its own community. Thirdly, even within religious communities, sects have a right to belief against their own core religious denomination. Fourthly, the right to belief has three distinct dimensions. That is, the right to profess, the right to practice, and the right to propagate." Unquote. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the most important functions of the Supreme Court in a democracy is judicial lawmaking. There are situations when a judge finds uncertainty in law. This un uncertainty is a catalyst for judicial creativity. In the context of U.S., Brown versus Board of Education was product of such an uncertainty. Similarly, the judgment on religious freedom by the Supreme Court of Pakistan was a product of a societal insensitivity to religious freedom which led to uncertainty in law. When I laid down my robe as Chief Justice, one of the comments made in media was, and I quote, Justice Jelani, in his short tenure, brought about a silent revolution in religious minority rights. Through a judgment, he interpreted Article 20 of the Constitution as giving non-Muslims absolute equal religious freedom of belief, worship and propagation with their Muslim brothers, with Muslims having no superior rights to religious belief. It also issued numerous directions for the protection of religious minorities and established a permanent bench of this court for their redressal, unquote. Now, addressing the second concern, which was judicial interference in the policymaking domain of the executive, I made a, well, I made it a point to share my concern with all the stakeholders. Right in my first speech as Chief Justice designate, a, a day before I took oath, in the full court reference held in honor of the outgoing Chief Justice, I made it clear that this distinction is being blurred. On the judicial side, I reiterated the principle of trichotomy of power in two judgments. I need not quote both the judgments, which find mention in my paper, but I'll just 
quote a punch paragraph of a judgment wherein the privatization of one of the major banks in Pakistan was challenged while dismissing the petition and upholding the privatization. I said, and I quote, the court while dealing with cases <coughs> relatable to financial management by the government are awarding a contract by it must appreciate that these are either policy issues or commercial transactions requiring knowledge in the specialized field. The court lack the courts lack the expertise to express any opinion on the soundness uh, otherwise of such acts or transactions. The courts should ordinarily refrain from interfering in policy making domain of the executive authority or in the award of con contract unless there is a rider, unless those acts smacks of arbitrariness, favoritism, and a total disregard of the mandate of law, unquote. Then, as a Chief Justice, I organized an international judicial conference in which there were the various sessions, and I dedicated one session on economic development and the, ro the role of judiciary. I e invited economists to candidly comment on the on uh, judgments of the Supreme Court, which uh, uh, you know affect uh, the e economic development, and they were they were very candid about commenting on our judgments. Now, while dilating on the role of the Supreme Court in Pakistan. I must add that although religious freedom is a constitutional right, it's a fundamental right, but in a Muslim majority country, what are the parameters of this right of religious freedom? The Supreme Court in a judgment dilated on this issue also. In a religious state like Pakistan, a liberal democrat may have concerns about the enjoyment of his fundamental rights and the court was very conscious of this concern. A typical case which is reflective of the Supreme Court view is a case where a piece of legislation which sought enforcement of Islamic provisions uh, supposedly Islamic provisions that bill was called Hisba bill was challenged uh, uh, was passed but the federal government on account of political, it was a provincial act of uh, Khyber Pakhtunsa province, which was headed by uh, a party which, ha which was uh, on the religious right. Now, because of uh, fear of reaction, the federal government did not directly challenge the the act, but it filed a reference before the Supreme Court of Pakistan. The court declared the offending provisions of the said bill to be ultra vires of the fundamental rights and directed the governor of, of province not to grant assent. The judgment is important for three reasons. First, it laid down that religious freedom is not absolute and it has to conform to other laws and the constitution. Second, that in the event of a conflict between a law which is being projected as religious and fundamental right provision of the constitution, the later shall prevail. And third, 
It was a case in which political issues were brought to the court because the political le leadership was shy of the extreme right. It could not resolve the issue in the political domain fearing backlash from the fundamentalist lobby and filed a reference in the court. The Supreme Court in Pakistan has been conscious <coughs> that it has to play an active role as an important pillar of the state to sustain democracy. The expansion of fundamental right jurisprudence has transformed the court from a formal constitutional court to a court with a human right face in which the essence of constitutional interpretation is people-oriented people oriented leading to a reconstruction of judicial review. This transformation of the court is the essence of the judicial anthem of the Supreme Court, which it may be of interest for you, was created by me. It is engraved on the entry gate of uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, and mind it, it was not me who said it should be uh, engraved there. I was not the Chief Justice then. It was the full court which decided that and declared it an anthem. While dispensing justice and exercising its jurisdiction relatable to the enforcement of fundamental rights, the Supreme Court has kept three considerations in view. Number one, that democracy is one of the, that, that judiciary is one of the three organs of the state and good governance is possible only if three remain within their defined limits. Second, that the law may not keep pace with changing times and may not cater to every situation. The court, and particularly the Supreme Court, has to bridge the gap between the law and societal dynamics. This consideration is particularly relevant to the powers of the court, the Supreme Court, under Article 184.3 of the Constitution. And third, the court has been conscious that as member of the United Nations and being part of global community, Pakistan has a certain obligations under international law. Any activity with the, the country that has or has the potential to have nexus with a criminal, with a crime committed outside the country, be it a financial crime or an act of terror, has to be brought to justice under the law. If laws are thwarted, it breeds contempt the society becomes prey to seg stagnation, resentment, violence, which in the world of connectivity is then exported. Dr. Martin Luther was alluding to this chain reaction of injustice when he said, and I quote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. The challenges faced by judiciary in Pakistan during the last few years has recharged the judiciary, particularly the Supreme Court. It marked the beginning of a constitutional jurisprudence. It has led to an end, of an end to constitutional deviation, that is, free imposition of frequent martial law. It has established a social role of the rule of law, which had the effect of greater, uh, creating greater awareness among the people of their rights and the values of democracy. This change in constitutional culture of our country has five distinct phases.
one is that the events of 2007 when the judiciary was sacked and then there was a mass reaction and Jainal had to restore it. These events led to a bitter realization that mere formal constitutional legitimacy based on textual guarantee the constitutional textual protections cannot protect judicial independence and power. It is, in fact, the legitimacy of the Supreme Court in the eyes of the public as the guardian of those values of justice that guarantees its independence and sustained prestige. Second, the court the Supreme Court is not merely mandated, mandated by the Constitution, but in fact is bound by the spirit of its office to exercise its independence in order to provide a necessary check on the actions of the legislature and executive. The court is fulfilling this role with an appropriate zeal and enthusiasm, but not with regard to the importance of other pillars of the state. Nevertheless, this deference to other pillars of the state did not prevent the court to proceed against the prime minister when he disobeyed a court order. He was con convicted for contempt of court and he had to leave the office of the prime ministership that is Yusuf Raza Gilani. And the other case is that of the, the, the man who was current, uh, still recently the Prime Minister, Nawaz Sharif. Uh, there were serious allegations of corruption arising from the Panama League papers and the Supreme Court found that uh, uh, his conduct was not forthright and that he was not qualified to hold the office of the Prime Ministership. He had to leave the office and he is facing trial. Now this judgment has been subjected to criticism and acclaim both. I need not uh, go into details uh, but uh, in all such uh, judgments which have uh, a political dimension, uh, such criticism um, uh, comes. Now I have been told that the time is almost over. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'll just briefly uh, uh, say that uh, this I'll just briefly comment on a very important function of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, through its judgment, has to play an uh, educative role and thereby di disseminate the constitutional values. It has to act as a pedagogical institution because as <coughs> uh, rightly pointed out by Thomas, Je uh, Thomas Je Jefferson, and I quote, even under the best forms of government, those entrusted with power have in time perverted into tyranny. The most effectual means of preventing this is to illuminate the minds of the people at large, unquote. So the Supreme Court, through its judgments, has to illuminate the minds of the people. It has to keep that objective in mind while laying down its opinion. Before I conclude, I may add that the court is a human institution 
and may not be perfect. As aptly remarked by a former judge of, and I quote, US Supreme Court, and I quote, we are not final because we are infallible. We are infallible because we are final, unquote. Ours is a rainbow account of judicial history. The court has passed through testing times, but mostly it has led to institutional vindication. The assertion of judicial independence, the rise of vibrant media, a vigilant civil society, and the emergence of an independent media would go a long way in strengthening democracy, political institutions, and ensuring an expanded enforcement of the rule of law. The idealism reflected and sacrifices made during the movement launched for judicial independence are a testimony to people's faith in the Constitution and its abiding values. As long as this spirit is alive, the Constitution and the law uh, re shall reign supreme. For as Leonard Hand very aptly remarked, and I quote, liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. When it dies, no Constitution, no law, and no court can save it, unquote. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Justice. <coughs> uh, we probably have time for maybe one or two questions if anybody would like to pose them, and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. Gentleman in the front. Um, and please, um, we'll go ahead and ask both questions, and then we'll give the Chief Justice sure. an opportunity. I just want to say thank you, Justice Jelani. Uh, also wanted to say that anyone here should read the opinion that they wrote on religious tolerance and freedom. It's a, it's a legacy to the history of uh, judicial decision making globally. Number two, I think your Law and Justice Commission in Pakistan is a very important model for administering, in view of its administrative effects in Pakistan and the inclusive approach used in the Law and Justice Commission to helping manage the justice system. I think your remark regarding that governance body would be very helpful uh, to the audience. Thank you. And to the gentleman in the back. Uh, yes, uh, Chief Justice, uh, my name is Kami Bhatt. I'm with the Pakistani Spectator. And my question is that uh, I have green passport, even though I've been here for more than 30 years. And my question to you is this. Can you f have sound sleep in a country where over 80% people do not have access to healthy water? Still, General Musharraf, Mr. 10%, Nawaz Sharif has billion of dollars stacked up abroad where they, get, they are getting lowest interest rate. And my question, the other question is, related question, uh, how can I convince my American friend as a journalist that Pakistan is a country where only general our justice are not corrupt, and rest of the institution are corrupt, because no justice or no general ever served prison in Pakistan. Thanks. Easy Wait. questions. <laughs> First, I uh, respond to your question. He asked a question about the Law Commission or the uh, judicial policy making committee of uh, Pakistan which comprises of which is headed by the Chief Justice of Pakistan and it comprises of five Chief Justices of four provinces and Islamabad capital territory now this committee uh, has periodical meetings and uh, it, it's a uh, carries out research about uh, uh, which law uh, requires uh, reform 
it entertains suggestions for new legislation and uh, then after deliberation is uh, it sends its proposal to the uh, law department for onward transmission to to the concern committee of the parliament so it's a permanent body uh, which is uh, headed by uh, the chief justice and is uh, but i i would uh, uh, like this body to be uh, a little more active and uh, i uh, i would uh, suggest that uh, it should uh, comprise uh, more academics in it uh, people who who can uh, do research work and uh, come out with uh, their uh, uh, suggestions about reforming various laws. Thank you, Mr. Alastair. And, uh, well, uh, uh, your question uh, is reflective of certain concerns, uh, and uh, those concerns may be shared by many but uh, you try to appreciate that um, uh, I have been a part of judici judiciary and uh, the judiciary has done its bit to reform the system and the, the system uh, is on its way to uh, reformation but the kind of change and the kind of question uh, you have asked it's more political and uh, it relates to political changes um, it relates to political parties it relates to uh, uh, so uh, I, I may not be the best person to respond to this question Well, we've already extended the time as originally scheduled, so um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, ask that we close the symposium first by f uh, thanking our keynote speaker from traveling so far to be here and all of the panelists who participated and, of course, all of you who have uh, taken time out of your day to learn, hopefully, uh, uh, various lessons uh, and important uh, lessons learned in this experience about uh, judicial independence. Uh, as part of the Just Tech program and in light of our efforts to be both transparent and monitor and evaluate, I remind you that if you've not completed your evaluation form, uh, the bright lime green form, uh, please do so on your way out. We look forward to seeing you again. Uh, please be aware that there will be an introductory training in November followed by other symposia and all that information can be found on our Just Track website. So thank you again and a good afternoon.